The race is on, and Sergio Perez claimed his first Red Bull victory in the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, a race that left Max Verstappen tired and Lewis Hamilton emotional. I'm Ed Straw, and with Baku promising and delivering the unexpected with Sebastian Vettel and Pierre Gasly also on the podium, Scott Mitchell and Mark Hughes join me to explain how it all happened. Well, Mark, do you remember when we came to Baku for the first time and everyone thought it was quite dull and, and predictable? Yeah, that first race was, because the, the Formula 2 race uh, had been absolutely terrifying. And I think quite a few of the F1 drivers were watching that and um, sort of decided to behave themselves. But ever since then, ever since that f- we got that first one out of the way, it's, it's been a riot, hasn't it? And uh, this one didn't dis- disappoint either. It did, though, Scott, for a time, convince us that it might be straightforward, because we went a while before we got into into yellow flags and safety cars with uh, Lance Strolls off. Yeah, but that's what this circuit does. You know, ba- Baku uh, Baku has produced some absolute wild races in its short history, but those races are the sort of Grand Prix that um, ignite really suddenly. And it is not coincidence. The factors, uh, the factors are re- that this circuit have in its favour lend itself to creating these um, chaotic moments. And um, obviously today, twice it was... Um, tyre blowouts, tyre failures, whatever you want to call them. Um, And there will obviously be suspicions that a big part of that is Pirelli's shortcomings. But the other part of that is it's the nature of Baku. Um, There's always something about this track that could catch a driver out, whether it's it's the nature of the layout with the offset of, uh, you know, low drag on the straights and needing downforce for the corners, whether it's the fact the walls are so close, whether it's changing wind direction, whether it's the, 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 the sheer difficulty of some of the corners, something can always happen. So even if you do have a race that's a bit of a slow burner, it doesn't mean you're necessarily set to the finish. And unfortunately, Max Verstappen found that out the hard way today, didn't he? <laughs> Yeah, what we saw today certainly bears out everything you said, and many of those factors came into play. So, should we pile into it, Mark? Should we start off by dealing with the two world championship contenders? Lewis Hamilton led early after passing shock pole sitter Charles Leclerc, but Verstappen jumped him easily enough, in fact, through the pit stop sequence. Did Hamilton and Mercedes ever really have a realistic chance of staying ahead in a straight fight? Not really. I mean, he, he may have stayed ahead in the um, pit stop window, but they hadn't had to hold them for Pierre Gasly coming in. Um, he may be able to retain the lead at that at that window, but the the, the car couldn't hold on to a, a pace as long as the Red Bull could, um, because it had a super skinny wing on. The Red Bull had quite a, a, a decent wing on, and that was the you know the the underlying reality of the weekend was that the Red Bull was just an intrinsically faster car, and uh, qualifying mixed that up a little bit. Um, and, and wing levels as well, just the circumstances of qualifying and, and the wing levels as well, because you can get a good, you can get a good time around Baku with a with a skinny wing, um, but you you can't get a good, good really race pace like like that. But if you're not in any position to compete, which Mercedes and Ferrari weren't, then it's very tempting to take the the low wing option, which is what Red Bull historically used to do when they were underpowered. And they'd be in the pits after six laps with the tyres and shreds. Um, so that that underlying reality is always there. Um, so the, Verstappen would have found a way by it, it, at some point because Lewis's tyres wouldn't have been able to hold on it in the same way as, as the, the Red Bulls. Yeah, and ultimately, you said if he finished third behind the two Red Bulls, that would have been a pretty good save considering where things looked after FP3 because he was still all at sea, really, wasn't he? And it's only the, the decisions they made with a low downforce rear wing in qualifying and really committing to that approach that allowed him to qualify higher than looked on the cards. Yeah, that, that, that's where um, it, it, that decision sort of transformed his weekend because they were absolutely nowhere until um, until he went in that direction. Valtteri didn't. Valtteri stayed with the the high wing. And you could see the logic of doing that, of staying with the high wing, because it's it's the, the, prop, the Merck's problem generally on these low grip circuits and l- low grip surfaces and um, corners which don't really place much energy through the tire. Uh, they, the logical thing for a car which is reluctant to switch its tires on, which the Mercedes is, we know, um, is is to whack a load of downforce on it. But that just wasn't working. So um, Lewis went in the other direction, and it it did switch the car on. And then the circumstances of qualifying played out, and you know he, he stuck it on the front row. But uh, um, yeah, I think. Had everything just gone, 
you know, with, with without the the tire blowouts and things, um, had everything just gone to par, if you like, yeah, probably a decent third would have been a decent result, and and he may have got a second if um, if Perez had been a retirement, which he was very close to being. Um, so we, we we find out after the race that um, uh, Perez's car was. Uh, on the point of packing in because its its hydraulics were were about to die, so Aston Martin um, didn't realise how close they came to winning that race. Even though um, even though it was a obvious, probably inevitable, as Mark was saying that um, Hamilton was going to fall behind Verstappen, it's a shame that we had that hold in in the pits because it would have been I think it would have been very very close on on pit exit and just even if Hamilton had been a sitting sitting duck and even if it had been just a pretty simple blast pass on the start finish straight always want to see that sort of stuff happen on track and I, I said to I said to you Ed when we were discussing it during the race like Hamilton's move to take the lead from Leclerc w- was pretty routine but there was just that moment where there were three cars within a second down into turn one and there was a genuine pass on the lead on that would have been what the um sort of end of the second lap start of the third lap sort of crossover wouldn't it um and it that that's just so much better to see. So uh I would had Verstappen not had that failure and won the race, I certainly wouldn't have begrudged in the victory and I would never have said it was lucky because he inherited it because of Hamilton's problem in the pit stop. N- not at all. It's just um it's just always slightly frustrating when you have something that finely poised and then a factor like that gets uh, gets in the way. Yeah, and certainly both Red Bull drivers were very quick around their pit stops as well. So their in laps were were strong. So yeah, I'd I'd agree it would have happened whatever happened but yeah it's always good to to have an on-track change of, of position well obviously as everyone listening to this will know Verstappen was leading late on when he had the uh the tyre failure but we'll get on to the detail of that in a minute but Scott we had this unprecedented two-lap dash from a standing start after the red flag and it actually turned the race into one of sliding doors moments for the championship contenders because Hamilton started second was attacking Perez into the first corner but then it all went spectacularly wrong for him yeah, it did. This was a um, uh, th- this was an example of a slightly different version of sort of sprint races in a Formula One weekend format, wasn't it? Where you get through qualifying normally, you do the majority of the Grand Prix, and then you have this little sprint dash to the finish. Um, and uh, Hamilton must have thought <clears throat> Hamilton must have thought that sort of all all his Christmases had come at once because he's gone from staring down the barrel of third place and a Max Verstappen win and this gap opening up in the championship to suddenly being second and Verstappen out of the race and suddenly he's leading the championship by a long way to then being second on the grid of a standing restart, getting a better launch than Perez, getting side by side with the Red Bull and leading into turn one. And with only two laps left and with the speed that the Mercedes had in a, a straight line, there, there would have been a reasonable chance of him holding Perez off and winning. But that moment of whatever it would have been, joy, ecstasy, sheer, I can't believe this is my luck, lasts for about a second because as soon as Hamilton jumps on the brakes for turn one, he locks up very aggressively, the front wheels, flies into the runoff area and it's because um, uh, at some point during that brief sprint to the first corner, Hamilton thinks it was when he moved uh, to to avoid Perez coming over to try and close the door, he um, he's accidentally hit uh, a switch that Mercedes calls the um, the the magic toggle, which um, basically activates a, a a preset that moves the brake balance mass like aggressively far forward. I've heard it described in the past as sort of like north of seventy five percent. Hamilton described it as basically a switch that gives him no rear brakes, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, as soon as he's touched the brake into turn one, um, he's flown into the runoff area. At the time, and for a while afterwards, until we we heard this, it just looked like sheer over exuberance from Hamilton, and like he'd misjudged it. Um, I think I even said at the time, you know, when he was sat in the pit lane waiting for the restart, he messaged his team over the radio to say, "We need to remember this is a marathon, not a sprint." And then it looked like within a few seconds of the restart, he just sort of like trod over trod completely over his own mantra but as it turns out I don't think it was quite the um it was an error because ultimately he's hit the toggle but it wasn't quite the area that it looked I think 
from the outside initially. Yeah, and certainly he was kicking himself after what happened. As you'd expect, as any driver would be, he was uh, very, very uh, down and low after the race, given that he knew that he'd missed an opportunity. And obviously Max Verstappen was, while still down because he'd lost a win, was, I think, a little bit less down than he would have been had Hamilton finished second or even first and opened up a, a big championship lead. So... Yeah, it's ended up a race that could have been really significant in the championship. Whatever happened, either Verstappen gains a load of points or Hamilton gains a load of points, it's actually everything's cancelled itself out. So it becomes a a, a what-if race for all of them. Let's come back to the tyre failures, Mark. Verstappen's rear left failed. That was on a set of hards that were completing their 34th lap. I think earlier Lance Stroll had a rear left go as well. That put him in the wall. 30th lap, I think he was on. He was just finishing. Pirelli suspect debris, so why and do you believe it? Because some have expressed some scepticism. I can understand the scepticism because it's um it was uh they were historically far apart. You know, the strolls happened um much earlier in the race because he'd started the race on the hard and um Verstappen um, happened much later in the race, which um but as you say, it was on a very similar um number of laps for the the hard tire. And of the three compounds, the hard tyre was the only one that could do that number of laps. So, um, yeah, it does it does uh, make make you wonder. Um, but it, it's it's also feasible those debris because there's, there, there was plenty of debris around. As you know, there'd been plenty plenty of incidents. But it does seem a little bit strange that it happened at um, such um, widely spaced. Um, moments in time, but um, similar uh, sort of time within within the tyres' history. So, uh, yeah, I, I doubt we'll ever hear the full analysis um, that, that you know they they'll, they will be doing internally. Um, so it, it'll just get um, sort of lost in history, I think. But yeah, it could have been much much worse than it was because you got. Um, and they've got the pit wall there, and they're doing sort of south of 200 miles an hour in Max's case. And uh, it, it's you know, he, luckily, he bounced it, it sort of tank slapped and went went in the other direction. But you know, you can imagine going if it had sort of gone you know sideways on towards the pit wall. It, it, it's it's it, these things I, I don't think, um. Should be taken as just part and parcel of, of racing. I think it really needs to be properly investigated because it, that's not it's not really acceptable that 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 this should happen. You know that, that it's, even if it is even if it is debris damage, um, I, that's one thing. But I, I think it it warrants a very very serious investigation. Yeah, and Pirelli's bagged up all the tyres, both the ones that failed and a bunch of other ones, because Lewis Hamilton, on his set of hards that he used in what was his middle stint in in the race, was found to have a a cut on the left rear as well, which was six or seven centimetres across, not quite as deep. And obviously that's the one thing with the age of the tyres, the older the tyre, the more wear there is, the less tread there is to protect if there is a cut. So there's all these factors. It becomes very difficult to to be absolutely certain about it. Either way, what Mario Sola said is it's definitely not a wear-related issue because there was still tread on both the tyres. Both of those two tyres are intact enough to see that it hasn't just worn through the compound and into the construction, which can lead to things falling apart. But we'll have an answer before the French Grand Prix at Paul Ricard, or at least we'll have an official answer, and we'll uh, we'll probably revisit it then. Scott, let's talk about our race winner at last, Sergio Perez. He said he needed five races to get his eye in, and here he is, bang on schedule, running on his sixth Red Bull start. But it really was a convincing weekend from Perez as well, wasn't it? Although he obviously inherited the lead from Max Verstappen, he was doing exactly the job he needed to be doing in that race, even before that. Yeah, he was he was excellent. Um, it was the closest thing to a complete weekend that he's put together so far for Red Bull. Um, it wasn't quite because he did under underperforming qualifying quite significantly. Uh, ended up, was it seventh fastest, I think, with a with pace that really should have been on the front row. Um, so, so yeah, it's still not quite 100% pieced together. He, he still hasn't peaked as a Red Bull driver, even though he's obviously now won a race and scored his best results so far. So he's peaking, but hasn't peaked yet. Um, and the, 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 thing, the thing that really impressed me about Perez on the Sunday was 
he offset most of that track position damage almost immediately at the start of the race. He had a great first lap. I think it was at turn one and turn three, he was able to move up to, 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 to fourth. He shadowed the, the top three in the first couple of laps. And then when Charles Leclerc's defence was finally broken up front, obviously Hamilton and Verstappen got by and then Perez didn't waste any time either. So he didn't lose didn't lose ground or anything anything like this and then he just he just did everything that Verstappen did just a couple of seconds back you know he he, he the rest of his first stint was excellent uh his in lap was was very good so he, even though he had the he even though he had a slightly slow stop the the in lap and the, I guess the combination of Hamilton not getting his tires up to temperature meant that Perez was able to to take that position um <clears throat> on on track and then there were a couple of moments where Lewis got very close, but Perez didn't yield. He he didn't lose didn't lose position. Um and we were getting into the final stages of the Grand Prix and he still sort of had Hamilton just about at arm's length. And he just he just seemed in control. He he didn't look like a driver who was gonna give up the position. And even if he had, even if Hamilton had been able to get ahead and let's say Max had made it to the finish, um then Perez would still have done a very good job for Red Bull in holding Hamilton back and protecting Verstappen. But he actually he did more than that. And it wasn't just the fact that he did more than the bare minimum as a wingman today. He also did so much more than Gasly or, or Alex Albon did in, in, in the second car. And in one race, he has basically vindicated Red Bull's decision and showing why he is an obvious, it's a no-brainer to keep him on beyond just one year in in 2021. So, um, the the win the win is obviously huge for him. It's his second of his career, first with the team. So there's loads of reasons why it matters. But I think just in terms of the quality of job he did, that's the best job anyone in the second Red Bull has done since Ricardo left. So uh, it was just it it wasn't something that he fluked. Yes, he got a bit lucky because Max had the failure, obviously, but he was next in line for a reason. He was next in line on merit. Well, he's ticked all those boxes we've talked about, hasn't he? He's backing up for Stappen. He's giving them a second car in the fight. So that's exactly what he's there for. And OK, one solid doesn't make a summer. We know he likes Baku. He always goes well there. I don't think he'd have turned in that performance and be at, at that level relative to Verstappen if he didn't have a good, a good handle on the car. So I guess, Mark, reasonable expectation that Perez can be at this kind of level or thereabouts now that he's come to terms with the car I guess slightly different circuits coming up will challenge him in different ways but he's now got enough time in that car to be somewhere approaching at one with it I'd say so yes and even though his qualifying ultimately wasn't um, anything special that was just a function of one scrappy lap um, and, and, and the red flags not allowing him the opportunity to do a second one um, generally, you know, every time the car went out, he was he was quick. He, or in Q2, he, he virtually equaled Verstappen's time and was about three-tenths quicker in Q2 than he was in Q3. So the, the speed was there. It was just, um, you know, unfortunate, the, the circumstances of Q3. But as uh, Scott said, he put that right within two corners and that, that was put him in Verstappen's wheel tracks immediately. And you knew as soon as he was in, in that position on the first lap, he thought, right now... He will have a good race because he, he just, you know, he hasn't got the slower cars to worry about. He has, hasn't got to use up his tyres trying to get past them. He can just do what he's good at, which is um, combine a good race pace where, with with um, looking after the tyres well. And you saw how quick he was on his in-lap. It was a fantastic in-lap. And that was just a function of how much tyre life he'd, he'd managed to save sitting behind Max. And it's great as well for him because it wasn't so long ago we were thinking, oh, will he even be in? Formula One this year and then of course he had the win late last season then gets the Red Bull drive could be looking at a very very different path but now he's done this he's looking like exactly the driver Red Bull needs so we can now start thinking about whether if he ticks a few more boxes in the next half dozen races certainly up to the the summer break can he cement that place for the next two or two three seasons and it'd be richly deserved he's worked really hard Perez he's evolved constantly as a driver and I really like the way he goes about things uh, these days he had quite a big blow when McLaren dropped him he didn't cover himself in glory with his approach but he's just constantly evolved really impressive driver and second Grand Prix win well done Checo 
Well, Mark, let's uh, break up our rundown and glance down to 12th place because that's where we'll find Perez's opposite number. Mercedes number two, Valtteri Bottas, completely anonymous weekend for him. Never looked like scoring more than a couple of points at best and just seemed baffled by his struggles. Can you shed any light on his difficulties? Not really. He can't and the, the, the team can't. It's just the the car's grip wasn't there. He was. It, it sounds as though he's just not getting the tyres into the window. I mean, he's, it, it, it's a car that's uh, susceptible to this anyway. Um, he found a way around it last time when Lewis didn't. This time the positions were inverted and Lewis found a way around it and Valtteri didn't. Um, but it, yeah, no point. At any point in the weekend, uh, did he look like um, anything other than a tail end of the midfield runner, really? Um, yeah, just awful, awful weekend. Yeah, and he was yeah very puzzled, very puzzled after the race. I asked him if, if he felt it was a, a tyre thing, and he said, well, the data temperature seems to be about the same as Lewis. Obviously, it's a bit tricky with the tyre temperature because the real key is the, sort of the, the, comp, the bulk of the compound, isn't it, temperature, which you can't actually measure. You can only infer it from measuring the surface and the carcass. So there might be something they're missing in there. He wants the team to have a good look at the car to see if there's something wrong, whether there's a chassis problem or... Every now and again, you get parts put in the wrong way or just some assembly problem, which seems pretty unlikely. But yeah, just we've, I don't think we've ever seen Bottas be quite so ineffective. I guess he was getting close to Imola, but at least we had a very clear explanation on that because that was absolutely the tyres and he understood that. But he, he just seemed like a completely lost character when I spoke to him after the race. I think the um, I think it's probably his limpest dry dry race, isn't it? You mentioned Imola. Obviously, Turkey last year was really bad, but um, in a pretty normal weekend, I know Mercedes have had the problems, and it was actually I I thought it was a little bit Hamilton and Bottas rolls reversed from Monaco. Obviously, Bottas was able to make that step, wasn't he, in um, in qualifying and and for the race in, in in Monaco, and he he should have had a strong result there. See the um, whatever it was, thirty-six hour pit stop didn't 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 help. Um, but here, whereas um, you know they, they they were both they were both nowhere through practice, and obviously Hamilton jumped up to third or whatever it was in FP3, but that was just massively toe assisted. He said that even before even between FP3 and quality, they were still changing stuff on the car, and the, the difference was they just. It worked for Hamilton and Mercedes said, I think Andrew Shovelin said on um, Saturday after qualifying, that for whatever reason, Bottas's car just hadn't responded at all to the changes they were trying to make. So it was just very confusing. Um, I think it's it's not that he needs Mercedes to find a problem with the, the car, but I think Bottas will be hoping beyond hope that Mercedes does because... Otherwise, the simple reality is that this race kind of just exposed Bottas's main weakness at the front in F1. You know, we know that he's an incredibly fast guy, and when he's leading from the front, he can do the job. He's won several races. Um, he he on sheer pace alone, performance alone, he does merit a, a top drive in Formula One. But I do think he's a bit limited as a racing driver. I I never really see any kind of I don't never see the body language of his car when he's in traffic that makes it look like he's about to make something happen. And I know that these cars are difficult and even sometimes Hamilton gets stuck and doesn't make stuff happen. But Hamilton does make stuff happen more often than not. Um, Bottas just tends to get stuck. And maybe there's a maybe there's a, a, a car problem that's at the, at the root of it. But this just looked like another example of that, to be honest. Yeah, I just have to wait and see if Mercedes find anything which would obviously change the way we interpret what he's done this weekend but yeah a real real struggle and yeah he just slid out the points on merit he ended up sliding back to be battling just ahead of George Russell at uh, at one stage basically the, almost at the back of the midfield group so yeah a horrible weekend and the contrast with Perez couldn't have been greater because Perez was absolutely nailing the number two job whereas Bottas was totally invisible as far as the uh, the fight at the front's concerned. Scott, let's jump back to the front. We spoke after Monaco about Sebastian Vettel's excellent performance, fifth place. Here's another one, second place. Frustrated to miss Q3 by a few hundredths, but this was another old old Vettel drive, wasn't it? I not mean he's aged, but it's the Vettel of old. It's absolutely, it's that Schumacher-esque ability to nail the pace when he really needs it, manage the tyres, go hit those laps, make the passes when you need to, did everything. 
It was a vintage Vettel drive in a um, in a bit of sort of Force India era Team Silverstone, wasn't it? Uh, this, this is this is a team that in its old uh, uh, as its old identity has had some um, some glorious days in in, in Baku. Uh, combination of um, smart strategy, slick work from the team, a good race car, and excellent driving from from the lead driver uh to to be there to be to be quick when it matters and to be there to pick up the pieces as others fall by the wayside in the past that's been Perez hasn't it for Force India has, has he got like two or three podiums i think in 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 Baku for over, over the years um and it was Vettel it was Vettel here he was um yeah he should have been in Q3 i think in qualifying but he he made a mistake he had a lock up on on the lap that counted in Q2 um, and that obviously gave him free tyre choice for the race. He did an excellent first stint, a long first stint. Um, and he just never looked like he was lacking pace. And it, But then it wasn't just about pace. And I think this is the thing that's really encouraging is how many times have we been on a podcast over the last year or so and sort of ended up having to discuss Vettel's racecraft and sort of, oh, he's lost out in battle or, you know, he's been found wanting. And when it counted here, and he had to put the moves on, he got aggressive and he made it work, didn't he? He 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 earned so much of what he ended uh, the Baku weekend with. So I just think whether it was pace or racecraft, Vettel absolutely shone. Yeah, they're getting value for money out of Vettel now. He's he's really delivering on uh, just absolutely making the most of the car. He says he's fairly comfortable in it now. There'll probably be still a little bit more to come. It's inevitable there will be. He's only six races in, but. It's great to see. You want to see drivers delivering at their at their level. And although I've been critical of Vettel at times in recent times, it's because he's not been performing at anything like the level we know he can. But he now is, and that's that's what we wanted to see. We're revitalised in that scene. We should, as a, a side note, say that Stroll, uh, Stroll, before he had his problem, he was on course for a, a points finish, or at least a points finish. He did a very long stint on the hards before eventually he had the, uh, had the failure, which was also suspected to be down to debris according to Pirelli, and yeah, he'd, he'd have cycled out in, in 10th place, I think, when he'd made his pit stop. So uh, could have been a double points finish, albeit uh, Vettel, very much the majority partner. Mark, Alpha Tauri, Pierre Gasly in particular, quite surprising this weekend. Third place, great reward for them. First podium since the win at Monza last year. Some robust defending in the two-lap mini pre at the end as well. But a really convincing weekend. He just seemed to be on it from the start. Yeah, he's in terrific form around here. Um, he's... I was watching some of the um, some of the in car and through through that old town section. He was really, really, very, very impressive and um, really sh- skimming the walls with with such precision and aggression. Uh, he just got a lovely flow around this place, and the cars clearly working from them. He was saying after the race that um, we, yeah, it, it, it's sort of it, it is going really well, but we. We don't understand, so that's what we really need to do. We need to understand why it's going so well, <laughs> so which is a, an unusual way of looking at it. But yeah, it's it, it, it's it's good to see his confidence is right up. Um, I think the Honda was performing very well. Uh, there was we were talking go before the race about um, how it would compare on deployment, and it was uh, deploying a little bit longer than the Mercedes, not as much longer as Mercedes had feared, but it was it was did have an edge, so that 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 helped. Um, he had a little bit of a, a power reduction sort of late later in the race, which um, made him struggle a bit. But he he got um, he was able to get his elbows out in the mini pre, and yeah, he, he delivered that uh, lovely lovely podium. Yeah, it looked like in that little two lap sprint he could he could get shuffled back, but yeah, really really feisty performance from him and just confident on the brakes and everything. And yeah, Alpha Tauri didn't expect to go well in the slow corners and. Wasn't expecting much from Monaco or here, but he's come away with two good results. Of course, he was six at Monaco, if uh, memory serves. Scott, other Alpha Tauri, Yuki Tsunoda, seventh. Not at his teammates' level, but he really desperately needed a weekend like this one, didn't he? Perhaps being able to live without that shunt in Q3, though. Yeah, that is uh, that was more, much more like it. Um, he, he's, uh, he's put himself under pressure at times and he sort of felt the squeeze from Red Bull. They obviously moved him to uh from the UK to to Italy um to be closer to the team, to be a little bit more under Franz Toss uh, watchful eye. <laughs> um 
it's already sparked a little bit of complaining from Yuki because the poor guy has to go to the gym twice a day. Um, he feels a little bit, uh, <laughs> he feels a little bit tired. Um, but it's uh, it's obviously way too early to correlation doesn't equal causation, does it? But I think Red Bull will already feel immediate vindication because this was a very mature weekend. Yeah, he crashed in in Q three, but it's better to crash on your um, on the the lap where you're basically hanging everything out, isn't it? When you've already banked that sort of top ten start, um, and I thought he actually drove drove a pretty good race. That there was the usual bit of getting a bit too emotional in at one one stage. He told his engineer to shut up, which I just <laughs> I just I just don't I I just don't I don't don't get it to be to be completely honest. But uh, um, I I thought that. I thought that what he did was, um, by and large, did what Alpha Tower had been asking him to do, which is take those take those peaks and just learn where the limit is because he oversteps it too often. And yes, he crashed in Q3. There was a question mark over whether he slowed enough um, under some double waved yellows as well, but ultimately he wasn't investigated or punished for that. Um and I think there were there, there was basically a vibe from Toss this weekend that basically like what makes Sonoda so exciting is basically what makes him an absolute nightmare as well because the team is basically like oh this guy's really really quick but he's going to crash at any moment and the quicker he goes the quicker he goes the bigger that fear is whether it's in qualifying or in the race there's sort of just this bit of hesitation I guess it's um I guess it's an element of trust. In the end, when you're watching Gasly and he's absolutely on the limit in that fight with uh, Leclerc trying to desperately grab that podium at the end, at least for me anyway, no part of you is thinking, well, he might overdo it here. Gasly's going to end up in the wall or something. But Yuki's still in that phase of his rookie season where I just feel like he's equally as likely to go and put it like second or third fastest in a practice session as he has put it in the wall. So that's what he's trying to sort of iron out at the moment and this weekend I feel like was a very good step towards doing that we saw how easy it is to make a mistake in Baku we know how easy it is to make a mistake in the race in Baku and ultimately when it counted Sonoda got the job done yeah and he is a driver we know has ability and speed and will be able to refine it he just needs to yeah get slightly better judgment I must admit his crash in qualifying in Q3 he was nowhere near making that corner. He braked so much. I mean, just just visually using various markers. The most conservative estimate is he was a good 40 metres later on the brakes. Ricardo crashed there as well. Ricardo was on the brakes so much earlier than, than Sonoda. <laughs> so it, it was one of those things you just thought that was a little bit optimistic. But you can forgive that on a weekend where he's had a, a good result. And he was battling hard in that uh, two-lap dash to the end as well. So he didn't lose his head there. He didn't hit anyone. He didn't hit the wall. Could have thrown it all away. Didn't. So, yeah, valid, valuable points for him. And the best finish he's had in Formula 1, the best qualifying now. So, yeah, good for him to get that uh, that seventh place. Let's move on to Ferrari, Mark. Well, specifically, let's go on to Charles Leclerc. Finished fourth. He was all over Gasly at the end. We didn't expect Ferrari to go so well here. So how did he find the speed to get pole position? I think we're going to come back to a point you've uh, you've made earlier about skinny rear wings. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, they, they brought two wings. They brought a skinny one and a super skinny one. And I think even their uh, higher downforce one was skinnier than um, than the... the 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 lowest downforce one of uh, Red Bull, so uh, as we say that 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 can get you a good lap time, um, and it's it's a it's a route that um, teams with cars that are a little bit underpowered or a little bit draggy are very tempted to make around here because you know it'll get you grid position and then that might end up giving you a better uh, race result than if you just did what was the optimum for the you know, the, the theoretical fastest time. If you were just circulating on your own, um, so yeah, they they did that. Um, it worked. The car is we already know beautiful in round slow speed corners, very agile. Got great um, the way it can the way it can turn early in the corner. Um, good traction, just really really nice through that middle sector. Um, and when they 
when you put a skinny wing on it, the new tires on a, on a single lap, the new tires can find you. Most of that, you you won't you won't be that much slower through there than if you've got a big wing on. Um, but you will cause gain a lot down sector three, down the, the long straight. And sector one, it doesn't make much difference because there's braking and straights there. So it, it it is a way of probably of giving you a better lap time going for that um, that, that sort of setup. But it's not a doesn't give you a very uh, consistent or uh, durable uh, in terms of tire wear uh, race car. Um, but yeah, he did. He did. You still have to put the lap together, and he did a beautiful lap. He got a nice toe, um, and there was a red flag which stopped anybody else from responding to it. So yeah. Uh, Ferrari have now got twice as many pole positions this season as Red Bull. Yeah, that's a good way of uh, good way of looking at it. It was never very likely he was going to stay ahead. Obviously, he lost the lead to Verstappen. He, he blamed that partly on the distraction of the branch that was on the track at uh, at turn fifteen that he had to cut the corner for. But uh, I don't think that branch did anything more than hasten the inevitable. I think it was it was going to happen as soon as he lost um, as soon as he had Verstappen within DRS range behind him. He was gonna he was going to lose out, wasn't he? And yeah, that's just, it's just the, the the way it is. But the fact that they can still be there in contention for pole round here is very promising, and it, it shows that the car still is able to work well because it's not just any car that can just take off that uh, that downforce and be so competitive. So yeah, a, a positive for uh, for Ferrari in in that regard. And Leclerc had one of those races that was a little bit lively, wasn't it? He had that huge lock up. Uh, he ended up fourth, pushing Vagasi. So it's one of those races that. On the one hand, he'll probably be a little bit disappointed not to be on the podium, but on the other hand, he'll be happy that he didn't slip down to seventh, which could easily uh, easily have happened. But, yeah, more big points for Ferrari. Good news for them in the battle for third in the Constructors' Championship. Scott, let's stick with Ferrari. Carlos Sainz had a very lively weekend, certainly pretty quick, but he ended up eighth. Had escape road visits both in Q3 and in the race, so he's probably right to be kicking himself, wasn't he? Yeah, he was very angry. Um, he he said that his trip down the escape road in the race was basically down to a lack of just a brief lapse in concentration. He he'd made his pit stop and um, he'd found afterwards that he was sort of locking the lock, just locking up a little bit too easily. But um, he just admitted he was probably thinking about something else a bit too much as he got into that section of the track and he just missed his braking point ever so slightly. Uh, flat spotted the tyres trying to get it stopped, went down the escape road, lost a bunch of time getting back on and, and getting going again. And then he had to do, obviously, the rest of that stint with the flat spotted tyres, was still making up decent ground. Um, but yeah, uh, is Leclerc turning whatever first into fourth? Obviously, getting beaten by Gasly was annoying, but... That was probably the expectation. Mattia Bonotto said that Ferrari were hoping for a bit more from the race after qualifying, but that wasn't really on Leclerc's side. Maybe a podium was possible if it was perfectly executed, and obviously the way the race turned out, it absolutely was possible if they'd perfectly executed it. But um, it's the it's the combination of turning first and fifth on the grid into fourth and eighth. So, yeah, they've nicked third in the Constructors' Championship from McLaren, but it's only by a couple of points, I think, and this should have been one of those races where they end up with a sort of a bigger haul than that. They, like I said, they they weren't, they probably weren't going to get both cars in the, in the top three or top four, but they, they could realistically have got both cars in the top five or the, at least the top six and signs who has um, generally been, been very strong. He has had a couple of moments this season where it's got a little bit messy. The first time was obviously Imola. Those were horrible conditions. So you can't really hold that against him. That this was just a race that he does he doesn't look back on particularly fondly. Yeah, you have to say from McLaren's perspective, this race and Monaco, Ferrari haven't done as much damage to them in the championship battle as they should have done. So it's it's a mixed bag for Ferrari, I guess, these two races. Great pace, two pole positions, perhaps not the points they they should have got. Mark, talking of McLaren, they were your tip for a surprise in Azerbaijan. Very good reasons for that, that you explained on our last podcast, but it didn't quite work out. Lando Norris came through to fifth. After that three-place grid penalty you had for not following the correct red flag procedure in qualifying, Daniel Ricciardo ninth. So is this a car not performing as well as expected or a team and drivers underperforming? As a little bit. The, the car wasn't quite as good as um, as, as I was expecting. But um, also I think um, 
you saw that uh, that that six was it sixth fastest time he did in qualifying um, was on old tires. So he he was about to do his new tire time, and of course the red flags came out, so he didn't see that. And then in addition to that, he got the three place penalty as well. So he started ninth, but could easily have been starting third or something like that. So. Yeah, we, it was a bit disguised, but it's still, I, I thought it would show actually better than that based on some of the traits we'd seen in earlier races. Um, but yeah, he, he pulled the result from it in the end. Uh, I think probably fifth is uh, about where it deserved to be. Yeah, I don't think there's any way to do a great deal better than that. And yeah, good effort from uh, from London Norris in the race. But Scott, you, you're a little puzzled by some aspects of that penalty. Got Perhaps you can briefly explain what happened when the red flags came out in it's q1 wasn't it the second red flag was it or the, or lose track yeah that's right um it was uh yeah it was basically that um norris was uh coming towards the end of the lap and there's a there's a light panel just before the the pit lane entry dividing line and as norris was approaching it the the light turns red and as he hasn't got to the pits yet he needs to dive into the pits. But I know I had a look back and he has maybe two and a half, three seconds between that light coming on and reaching the, the pit lane entry line. He sort of hedges his bets and goes inside the pit entry, but then he sort of second guesses it and doubts himself and he just gets a bit muddled. So he tries to ask the team whether he should pit or not. Doesn't get a response in time, so he decides to stay out but he should have pit and the reason for that is that when the red flag comes out you're not you're not allowed to cross the the finish line again um that'll obviously be because um there's either an obstruction on the circuit or it might be that they obviously need to get uh, recovery vehicles or emergency vehicles to the scene of the red flag as quickly as possible and a car going around is going to um interfere with that um but it was a genuine error it wasn't um it wasn't an act of carelessness, I don't think, um, and it didn't put anyone in danger. And had he been three or four seconds further around the lap, he'd have had to have done a whole lap anyway to get back to the pit. So crossing the line and extend, he, he doesn't extend the period of the red flag, if you see what I mean, like between the red flag coming out and then being able to send cars on track or whatever, uh, recovery vehicles on track or whatever. So... It's just a misunderstanding. So I I can understand the need for a grid penalty. Um, he's broken the rules. Um, there is no room for ambiguity in there, as race director Michael Mazzi said, because everybody knows in any kind of discipline, you red flag, you return to the pits. But I just think even the stewards acknowledged that there these were they were mitigating circumstances because of the just the sheer. Uh, lack of time Norris had to react you, you're kind of react, relying on instinct there and, in, and he, he basically hesitated and that hesitation stopped him from doing the, the, the correct thing um, so I, it just baffles me that he was given free license penalty points that basically means that the stewards here have determined Norris not pitting immediately when, in that situation to be as bad as Nico Hülkenberg start, starting that massive crash at Spa in 2018 the one that sent Fernando Alonso over the top of Charles Leclerc because Hulkenberg got three license penalty points for that. You know, the penalty point system exists to punish reckless, dangerous drivers and repeat offenders. To get a quarter of the way to a race ban for that, I just think is ludicrous and I just think it makes a mockery of the system. Yeah, uh, the license point system has gone wrong because it's just ended up being with a menu of... uh of points depending on the offence which I don't think is quite what it's there for eventually someone's going to get to 12 and it'll probably be for a series of really silly cumulative offences that'll just make F1 look a little bit ridiculous but uh, yeah hopefully nobody will get to that point Uh, Mark Fernando Alonso and Alpine highlight of that two lap shootout at the end was Alonso surging from 10th to 6th so that's a reminder to anyone who's doubting him that he's still got it because he's certainly racy yeah he was a classic Alonso there and there was the two laps he he just knows where to put the car he's, he's brilliant at that he always has been brilliant at that uh, whether he's in defense or an attack and it was all on display there that was absolutely vintage Alonso but even aside from that uh he, he definitely made some sort of breakthrough this weekend he was genuinely faster than Ocon 
not by much, but you know, the first time through a Grand Prix weekend where he has been faster than Ocon, uh, made it into Q3. The car, it, it was, it was probably he probably flattered a little bit in putting it in Q3, and the red flags helped him a little bit. But even so, um, the car was starting to sink back down to its natural level. But then and that's that's about what tenth, and then um, yeah, the uh, the 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 mini pre just give him an opportunity to shine and uh, there he was yeah he was very chirpy after the race alonso as well he said uh, he'd like more to lap grand prix because he was able to do so well out of it he he felt it was a really good weekend and that actually 10th would have been a poor reward given the quality of the work done so yeah sixth place good for him good for alpine hopefully the car's a little bit more competitive at, at future races it wasn't it wasn't super fast it's probably about probably a sixth best car Maybe a Baku weekend you'd probably put it at. So uh, sixth place, a good uh, a good result for that. Just to round up some of the other finishes, Kimi Raikkonen picks up the final point for Alfa Romeo in 10th. It's a good all-round weekend for him. Little misfortune in Q2 that left him slightly lower on the grid than hoped. Ahead of G- He was ahead of Antonio Giovinazzi in the end, who had that early pit stop, which was a strategic move and ended up 11th. And then the Haas drivers, 13th and 14th, they had a little bit of a spat at the end of the race, didn't they, Scott? They did, but the... Um... In, in pointing out that they finished uh, one of the one of them finished thirteenth, you failed to point out the very significant fact that this moves has to ninth in the constructors championship ahead of Williams. That's how bad those two teams are doing this season. A thirteenth place finish <laughs> moves you up a place in the championship. Um, but the uh, the significance of that spat at the end was it was basically that uh, Mick Schumacher was just absolutely furious with Nikita Mazepin for uh for 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 a last minute jink to the right as uh, Schumacher was preparing to do a pretty routine blast pass on the run to the finish line uh it's the you know it's it's incredibly incredibly fast at that point of the circuit um Mazepin was complaining that he's um he basically run out of battery so he was a sitting duck so at the last second, as Schumacher goes to go past him, he moves to the right. It's just unbelievable driving. Um, he has had criticism this year for moments of incompetence or, and sometimes criticism that's unwarranted because he's a, supposedly done something he shouldn't have done in terms of getting in the way or or overtaking in the you know final couple of corners before a qualifying lap and st- stuff that's not really warranted. This was out, outright dangerous. I think this is the worst thing he's done so far this season. Um, and yeah, Mick was... I mean, you you guys have been in enough media sessions with Mick. He's so... he he Calling him mild-mannered feels like it does him a disservice. <laughs> he's so... He's very polite, very well-spoken, and he doesn't really get too aggressive. He was absolutely livid over the radio. He, you know, he asked if, you know, what was he trying? He, I think it's something like, what, what's he trying to do? Is he trying to kill us? Um, and he was so, so angry to the point where he started laughing over the team radio, reflecting on how ridiculous it was. And he, at first, he couldn't let it go, um, and eventually he did. And, and Hass, obviously, they're going to say this, but they say that it's been dealt with and they've cleared the air. But oh, I was, I it. It's completely understandable why Mick was so angry. It was uh, it was a really stupid bit of driving. It's over thirteenth place. Uh, it's and it's your teammate, and also and you know that you've got a car moving slightly slower than you want it to. You can't do that. It's it's just yeah, it was brainless to be honest. Yeah, you cause plane crashes doing that kind of thing if you're not careful. And Mazepin has a reputation for being overly aggressive on track and doing that kind of thing, but he really needs not to bring into into Formula One. So I can completely understand why Schumacher's annoyed about that. And despite Gunter Steiner's best efforts, as you said, to pour some, uh, pour some calming waters onto it, if indeed that's a phrase, uh, he isn't very convincing. He's, he said what he has to, but <laughs> yeah, Mick Schumacher's going to remember that. And I completely get why he was furious. Uh, what was disappointing for me is it wasn't investigated. I mean, if that, that, that is, that's dangerous driving. That that has to be looked at by the stewards. And I know that the race is finishing and especially for Michael Mazzi, the focus might be on the front, but that that's that's 
just really poor and the um the uh, what's the word the the footage of it from obviously fans are watching on f1 tv um for starters that footage gets around really quickly so even if it wasn't seen live at the time it would have been it would have come into come to their attention pretty soon afterwards i'm sure of it i just i i don't really see why it wasn't looked at yeah it just seems like the kind of driving that you don't need it's just not necessary it was a it was like a reflex defensive action so i think mazapin was out of uh out of Ur's battery power wasn't he so he he knew he was he was in danger of being passed and it was just kind of a this oh i just try and try and cover it so i imagine yeah schumacher's heart would have skipped a beat which probably explains why he was he was so uh so frustrated well these two races have been very very good for red bull in terms of pace haven't quite got the results for Stappen wise that they would have wanted to across the sea but they've won both races but mark now we're going back to slightly more orthodox circuits paul ricard and then a double header at the red bull ring coming up do you think we'll see a little bit of a shift in the balance of power certainly it's got to be good news for mercedes hasn't it yeah i think so you get back to normal racetracks and put more load into the tires it's going to help mercedes um and the 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 tricky bit in that balance and equation becomes um like when we saw at barcelona um for Red Bull, do you um, do you cross that line where you're actually taking too much energy out of the tyres and losing time to the Mercedes through um, more more heat degradation, and slowing slowing down through the stint? So I think uh, it's going to be very interesting. I think for Ricard, um, lots of long high speed corners there. Yeah, looks like Mercedes territory. But uh, let's see. Um, there's, there's lots of twists and turns, and we still haven't we still haven't completed the jigsaw yet of the of how the two cars are, are performing. So, yeah, I wouldn't be definitive about it, but I'd say yes. Yeah, so the, the the low grip tracks are, are not Mercedes's friend, and the um, the more conventional tracks offer it a a better chance. Yeah, this is what we're going to see all season. It's going to swing back and forth between Red Bull and Mercedes, and we'll see how it all shakes out in the end. Thanks very much, Mark Hughes and Scott Mitchell. Head to therace.com, and don't forget the hyphen. Loads to read there, fallout from the race. Mark Hughes's race analysis will be probably up there and live and ready to read by the time you listen to this, and also my driver ratings will be appearing tomorrow morning, so you can... Look at them, disagree, and argue with me in the comments section. Scott Mitchell, what are you working on? I'm uh, exploring Signs' miserable, miserable race uh, and looking at a couple of sort of bigger picture things like the uh, the reaction to the to the race being um, red flagged and resumed for only two laps, uh, what Michael Mazzi said, what the drivers said, um, and also taking a look at things like uh, Vettel's... Um, the role that Vettel and yeah Force India at spec Aston Martin played in such a good result. Plenty to read from you then. Do check out our sister podcasts, including Bring Back V10s, the Race Indie Car podcast, and our MotoGP podcast as well. And also, if you like videos, check out our YouTube channel. Just search for The Race. Thanks very much for joining us for our look at a, a chaotic and unpredictable Azerbaijan Grand Prix in Baku. We'll be back soon to bring you more from the world of Formula One. <laughs> 